Hello, welcome to the uh, winter webinars. This is our final webinar for the month of July uh, while we're on TeleLink break. Just wait for a couple more members to join through and then we'll uh, we'll do a bit of an acknowledgement of country and obviously a uh, an introduction to our guest today. So once again, thank you for inviting us into your homes. Hopefully you're all staying warm because I know it's quite chilly in certain parts of Australia at the moment. Uh, hence why I'm all jacketed it up for this one. Uh, so while we're just waiting for people to come through, uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many lands on which we're meeting today. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So this webinar is designed to be a interactive session. So if you do have any questions for our guests throughout the session and you are using a screen reader, the, uh, you're looking to press keystroke alt H in order to bring up the chat function on the Zoom webinar. Type in your question and enter to submit it so I can get those questions through. Just wait for a minute or so more and then we'll introduce our guest who's waiting in the wings for us. Right. So our guest today, Megan Golding, has worked as a correspondent for Reuters and other media outlets where she covered war, peace, international terrorism and financial meltdowns in the Middle East and Asia. She's the author of three internationally best-selling thrillers, Stay Awake, The Night Swim and The Escape Room. The Night Swim in particular, which I was just saying to Megan, it remains one of the most downloaded audio books each month in the Vision Australia Library, uh, almost two years after its release back in 2021. Uh, her latest book, due to be released in August on the 8th, is titled Dark Corners. It once again follows Rachel Kroll, the true crime podcast that first featured in The Night Swim. Megan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here today. Awesome. So obviously Dark Corners reintroduces our readers to Rachel Krull, uh, a very, very, very popular protagonist from The Night Swim. Can you give us a little bit of an elevator pitch on where we find Rachel at the start of Dark Corners? Sure. So Rachel has returned home after The Night Swim, <laughs> the story of The Night Swim, and she gets a call uh, from the FBI. They need her in Florida. Um, a social media influencer um, has gone missing and they think that a guy who's in prison and who's about to get out of prison um, might know what happened to her. Um, and this particular guy is um, is suspected of being a serial killer, but unfortunately they don't have enough evidence to hold him. And they're hoping that Rachel will somehow get through to him and get the information that they need to help find this um, missing influencer who's disappeared out of her camper van. Yeah, right. Um, so I understand as well, we've got a bit of an exclusive here because obviously the book hasn't been released, but you've uh, organised a bit of a reading for us for today? Yeah, I thought I'd read the first chapter of um, Dark Corners uh, for you all. And um, it comes out on the 8th of August. So about uh, two, just over two weeks ago away, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, pretty close to. <laughs> yeah. So you want me to? I'll read. I'll start reading the. That would um, be that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. So um, the first chapter is a podcast chapter because um, Rachel is a podcaster. She does true crime podcasts. Um, so chapter one, and it says a Rachel Kral special report. Have you ever had a day when absolutely everything goes haywire and nothing goes as planned? I have, more than I care to remember. Like the time my kitchen pipe burst just as I was heading off on a date with my old college crush who was in town on business. Instead of rekindling the unrequited spark from college, I spent the evening frantically mopping the fl flood of water on my kitchen floor while waiting for the emergency plumber to turn up. My next door neighbor, Chloe, kindly went down to the bar across the road to keep my date company while I dealt with the plumbing crisis. 
By the time I joined them, they were hitting it off. Sparks flew like fireworks that night, just not with me. Incidentally, they've been married for three years, one baby, another on the way, cutest couple ever. It's unlikely they'd have met if my kitchen pipe hadn't blown. Was it fate or destiny? Your guess is as good as mine. It happened again this week. This time it was a telephone call that sent everything into a wild tailspin. I'd planned to spend the day catching up on admin work and tidying my apartment. I'd hoped to squeeze in time to paint a mid-century dresser that I bought at a flea market and was in the midst of upcycling. In the evening, I'd arranged to go to my producer's place with takeout sushi for a working dinner while we, went, we, while we went over stuff that had piled up while I was out of town. It was supposed to be a hump day, a day to get stuff done. That all fell by the wayside when the loud ring of my cell phone catapulted me out of a deep sleep sometime before dawn. Within two hours, I was staring at an airplane window at an aerial view of the eastern seaboard, sipping ice-cold reconstituted orange juice as I winged my way to northern Florida. By late morning, I was back on the ground. This time I was driving a rental car along the winding road of a state forest, glimpses of the omin ominous guard towers and barbed wire fences of a maximum security prison peeked through sun-kissed foliage. The prison was inc sorry. The prison was incongruently located on the edge of the natural wilderness. At that point, I still had no idea why I'd been asked to fly down. The FBI agent who woke me that morning had thrown in just enough information to pique my curiosity. I took the bait. No big surprise. Curiosity and procrastination are my kryptonite. It didn't, it didn't escape me that flying down to Florida without knowing why was the ultimate act of procrastination, proof that I'd do just about anything to avoid paperwork. As I drove through the forest to the state prison, I passed a timber sign pointing to a rudimentary campground off the road. Crime scene tape cordoned off the campground entrance, wasn't visible from my car. It was only later that I found out what happened there. The campground, which I've since visited several times, is designed for hardcore campers. It has no amenities other than a shower toilet block and the chance to camp under the stars. That's what Bill Morrow and his family were doing on the night in question. Bill and his two sisters had come with their respective spouses and kids on what I guess you'd call a family pilgrimage. They wanted their kids to experience the simple back to nature camping trips of their childhood. Without phones or gaming consoles, Without every waking moment being documented on social media, three days of uninterrupted family time, the way it used to be, social media detox, family reunion, hashtag get me out of here. They arrived in the afternoon in a convoy of three SUVs packed with camping gear and food. They remember noticing a camper van parked under a tree on the periphery of the otherwise deserted campground. The van screen door was loose. It rattled annoyingly in the wind. The campers paid it little mind. They were busy unloading equipment and erecting tents in a semicircle around a rusted metal fire pit on the other side of the campground. The campsite filled with the clang of tent pegs being hammered into the ground to a chorus of young kids hollering while playing tag and teenagers whining about poor cell phone reception and the inconvenience of being dragged on a family camping trip they considered to be a refined form of torture. Eventually, the exasperated parents tied a volleyball net between two trees and sent the teenagers off to play, which they did with the pained expressions of hardcore addicts going cold turkey. Their hard done by disgruntlement melted into genuine enjoyment when they won a kids versus parents volleyball tournament as the afternoon slid into dusk. By the time they were eating their dinner of barbecued hamburgers by the crackling campfire, everyone had shifted gears into vacation mode. As evening moved into night, an easterly blew in, causing the camper van door to slam more frequently. It got on everyone's nerves. That's when the camp campers had the first inkling that something was wrong. Ignoring their niggling disquiet, the parents sent the kids to bed. Once the kids were in their zipped up tents, the adults pulled their canvas chairs around the campfire to unwind after the long drive and exhausting day setting up camp. They stretched their legs towards the flames and sipped beers, reminiscing about the camping trips of their childhood and how similar, how simpler the world had been before gaming consoles and social media. The nostalgic mood was ruined when a powerful gust violently slammed the camper van door shut with an explosive crack that ricocheted across the campground. 
Six-year-old Billy Jr. was woken by the noise. Daddy, I'm scared, he called out, holding his teddy bear under one arm and gripping his sleeping bag with the other as he stuck his head out of his tent. His dad drained his beer bottle and rose from the canvas chair near the fire. I'm going to say something, Bill Sr. said. Otherwise, we can all forget about getting any sleep tonight. He stormed towards the van. His brother-in-law followed him, holding out a large flashlight. The campground was close enough to a swamp called Rattlesnake, Rattlesnake Lake to make him want to see exactly where he was stepping. Anyone home, Bill Sr. bellowed as they approached. Bill's brother-in-law fixed the flashlight beam unsteadily on the van door while mosquitoes tore into him. He scratched the bites until they bled. Bill Sr. started feeling uneasy as he pounded on the door. Even before I went inside, I could tell that something was wrong. There were these eerie reverberations coming from inside the van. When there was still no response, Bill opened the aluminium door. He could see in the musty interior was a haze of grey. I should say all he could see in the musty interior was a haze of grey. He stepped into the camper van. His brother-in-law heaved himself up as well. The van sagged under the cumulative weight of the two hefty men. Mosquitoes and moths followed them in, attracted by the bright beam of the flashlight. What happened inside that van is what this podcast is all about. It's consumed me ever since I came down here to look into this case. I've been looking for a predator. It turns out that a predator has also been looking for me. Wow. Certainly sets the scene. I've been camping with my kids and I can, uh, yeah, you've, you've done a very good job. I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you. Um, this is the um this is what it looks like for those who are able to see the video. Um yeah. beautiful cover by um, my publisher here in um in Australia, Penguin Random House. Friends of us as well. So thank you so much. Um so it it doesn't really sort of how much time has passed since the end of the night swim with this book? Is it pretty much straight away after that case or yeah, pretty much. Rachel's come back. She's kind of unwinding after this very intense time she spent in um, Neapolis covering a court case of a rape trial, which is the storyline of the night swim. And she's not really planning much other than catching up on all of her paperwork that has piled up. And suddenly she gets this call and agrees to go down and again gets caught up in a new mystery, I guess. Yeah. And look, I, we've already sort of touched on Rachel's a very popular character. Um, did you always sort of, did you leave it open to revisit this character? Um, did you always plan to revisit this character um, in future books? Um, I didn't necessarily, when I wrote The Night Swim, I didn't necessarily think I would be writing another book with Rachel Crowell, but I really liked her as a character and I liked um, for those who've who've read the Night Swim or listened to the audio book, um, it it has podcast chapters as well as the narrative, and I really liked that. You know, writing those podcasts and creating these sort of fictional podcasts. Um, so I was quite keen to do another book with Rachel Crow, but I I didn't want to just write anything, and I didn't want to revisit the Night Swim. So um, I tend to like to explore new different things with my books. So um, I was waiting for the right story to occur to me. Yeah. Um, so last year I had a book called Stay Awake, which was a standalone without Rachel Crowell, um, which came out. And then once that came out, I had the idea for Dark Corners and I started writing uh, Dark Corners with uh, Rachel Crowell. So uh, in your opinion, how has the character developed since the events of The Night Swim? Um, I think she's, um, I mean, Rachel is a really interesting character because she's got a background in journalism, which I relate to having worked in journalism yeah. for a long time. Um, but she's also become sort of, you know, an overnight sensation. So her podcasts became sort of the biggest crime podcasts in the, in the world effectively. And she's still coming to terms with being a well-known figure and, um, and she guards her privacy very carefully um, and she's also constantly walking this tightrope between trying to be accurate as a journalist and be be truth fair and truthful um, about what she reports uh, with, I guess, you know, I guess pro 
covering these terrible tragedies for effectively people's entertainment. I think she finds that a little bit of a um of a kind of a moral dilemma for her. You know, how does she, how is she, how does she try and bring good into the world without sort of turning it into to people's tragedies into sort of a popcorn fest? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, she has grown a bit. I mean, because of the timelines, because it, this sort of happens within a few weeks of the night swim, I don't know how much she's grown per se. Um, but certainly she she meets an FBI agent and, and there's a bit of romance in this novel as well, uh, mm. which is nice for her. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, her life is constantly um, in a state of flux, I guess. Yeah. So without spoiling the ending, can you see ways to further evolve the character and perhaps a third novel? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually developing a third novel at the moment um, and I have a few ideas. Um, I think that, you know, what the great thing about Rachel is because she's doing these true crime podcasts, she can almost cover anything, um, you know, anything that would be of interest to her podcast listeners. And so I think that gives me a lot of leeway in terms of the kinds of stories she can pursue. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Which suits me because as a writer, I don't kind of want to be writing the same story over and over again with different names. So um Yeah, definitely. And look at I guess the um the thing about the Night Swim being so incredibly successful around the world, did you find it a little daunting with the expectation involved with writing a sequel for Rachel? Uh, a little bit. Um, you know, I, I've I made the mistake where I don't do it as much anymore. I mean so obviously there's lots of online reviews and comments and I and I, it's not really a mistake, but I, you know, I, I tend to read them. And so they can really bring you up to a high or to a low, yeah. depending on whether people like or hate your book. And often people have, um, you know, they have preferences. They like this or they like that or they, and so as a writer, I sort of try and listen to it and I try and incorporate all of those things. And then you realize you can't actually, because you can't make everybody happy because, you know, the people who like X don't like Y and the people who like Y don't like X. So at some point you kind of have to stop um, listening and just sort of trust your own instincts um, as yeah. well. And that's the thing too, like a lot of people that are writing on these boards would be the first one to say, well, that was a bit predictable if you were to follow their lead on suggestions as well. So I guess people want to get lost in novels as well as be entertained. They don't want what they would expect. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's the thing. Some people want to totally something totally unexpected to happen, and then other people want it to be sort of grounded in reality, and then they get upset when something happens that's completely unrealistic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you can't, you can't make, you know, you can't make everyone happy. So you just have to do your best, and and hopefully just create a lot of suspense and make it a really thrilling ride, and give a nice, satisfying ending at the end. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Well, look, as I said, from reading your books, you definitely have a, a gift with that. So um, what was the, this is probably a question regarding the Night Swim, because obviously Dark Corners, she's already a true crime podcaster, but what was the inspiration behind um, the main protagonist being a, a true crime podcaster? Do you listen, do you listen to these sorts of things yourself or? Yeah, I do. I, I really do um, enjoy podcasts. I listen to a lot of different ones um, and, um, you know, ranging from, you know, true crime to politics to history. Um, and, in fact, my dad, who's 87, um, and um, he he has um, macular degeneration, so he's not. He used to read a lot, and yeah. now he's not able to read so much. I've been trying to encourage him to listen to podcasts because yeah. there's just so much out there and so rich in terms of you know materials and so many and just about everything that you want to listen to. It can be cooking, it can be books, it can be crime, it can be um, history. He's a big history buff. Um, so I listen to a fair bit of podcasts and I certainly like the the true crime genre and um and I just thought it was different you know there's so many books with a detective um who is the protagonist it's kind of nice to have somebody who's a podcaster who's delving into this not necessarily to um you know as part of the law enforcement but trying to bring truth to light and and by being a podcaster, it gives you some leeway because as a podcaster, they kind of can talk to the public and they can have these sort of conversations with people about evidence. Whereas 
if you're a detective, you can't, you know, there's limitations into what you can realistically do. Um, and of course, as a podcaster, she doesn't have access to a lot of information. So she has to kind of get people to, she has to have this whole kind of um, community helping her effectively investigate the, the crime and um, have that dialogue with the community um, who, you know, who listens to her podcast. So that's, that kind of creates a lot of interesting um, you know, opportunities for the storyline as well. Yeah, definitely. And look, the the character as a whole too seems to get pretty uh almost like a, a Sherlock mentality when a new thing has come across her desk that she can sink her teeth into as well. So she seems to quite get excited about um new cases and and ways and opportunities to show those investigative skills as well. Yeah, she um she gets intrigued by things and then um decides that she's going to go off and, and do a podcast and it's not necessarily something that you'd expect her to be intrigued about. So um yeah. <laughs> it's a fair bit of leeway. Um so we do have a question from Christy regarding the new book being in the Vision Australia library uh once it is out, yes definitely. Um so Christy will that's a watch this space sort of thing and and same goes as well. For your, for your dad there, Megan, uh, encourage him to get in contact with us because we do have a fully stocked audio book library. Um, so definitely happy to help him. Um, in regards to uh, the night swim, it kind of centred around this integral court case. Does Dark Corners follow this trend or does it mix it up a little bit? It mixes it up. So I didn't want to Rachel to constantly be covering court cases, even though I just loved that as because I just I've always loved um sort of I guess crime, um, you know, legal thrillers, you know, John Grisham and that kind of thing. And I've always loved those sort of TV shows where you have, you know, um, there's so many of them where, you know, you've got the court case and and all of that. So um, so the night swim Rachel was investigating um the, the, um, the, a case while covering a, a court case. Um, so it was kind of two cases. The one was a, 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 um, a case that was currently in court in which a um, in which a, a teenage girl accused a very um, high profile sort of future Olympic swimmer in the town of raping her. And while she was covering that case for her podcast, she discovered a, an, another case of a girl who was um, who died, possibly murdered uh, a couple of decades earlier. And the sister reaches out to Rachel to ask her to help. And so she's sort of investigating these two cases together and they kind of connected in some ways as well. Um, so the a court case was kind of front and centre of that. But um, in Dark Corners, no, there's no court case. She's searching for a missing influencer. Her name's Madison Logan. And um, she's what they call, she's a van influencer. So she travels around in her van and, um, you know, puts stuff up on Instagram of her having an amazing time and celebrating life and visiting the Grand Canyon and all sorts of places. It's based in the U.S., and um, Madison Logan comes to um, Florida and um, she's staying at a this remote campsite, the one that was described in the chapter I just read, and um, she disappears. And nobody knows what happened to her, where she went, but it looks like something bad happened to her. And um, and they believe that. Um, and sh sh I should say shortly before she disappeared, she went to a, a prison nearby the campsite and met with a prisoner. And... Um, the police believe that somehow the, the prisoner um, is a fan of Rachel Kral and the police are hoping that Rachel can get this prisoner to tell her what they discussed, what he discussed with Madison Logan before she disappeared. And they believe that he's somehow connected to her disappearance um, because of the coincidence of her meeting him shortly before she disappeared and um, the fact that they believe he was a serial killer and that he might have had an accomplice on the outside working with him. So um, so this is very much a search for somebody who's gone missing and Rachel's front and centre of that search. So we sort of touched on a little bit already in regards to sort of readers' expectations around a character. Um, how, as a writer, how much do you invest in your characters? Do you find it challenging at times to manage some of those expectations? Um, yeah, look, it is, I mean, especially, I guess, in 
um, you know, you're writing crime genre. And so, um, you know, well, well, for one thing, um, I read an interesting article um, recently, which is was talking about how people people like sympathetic characters. People want to read and watch sympathetic characters, but often the sympathetic characters are not the most interesting characters. If you think back to famous movies and so on, often they these sort of awful people, yeah. <laughs> flawed people, are much more interesting than. So you know, you kind of want to make your character. Um, you want to make your character sympathetic, and you want the audience to kind of you know, you want them to um, to support your character. Um, but at the same time, you want to keep your character interesting. And sometimes you can't be that interesting if you're too nice and you're too easygoing. So I always find that a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you do you feel like your writing has changed between these two novels? Uh, yeah, I mean, I hope so, because I'm always trying to improve. I mean, I don't think... Um, you know, I don't think that any writer can sit down and say, okay, I'm a perfect writer now, so I don't have to change anything. And so for me, I mean, I've, I've worked as a journalist for many years and then now I've been writing, I think this is my fifth novel, Dark Corners will be. So I've always, as a writer, tried to constantly improve and learn from what I've written in the past. So it's just this constant process of um, of getting hopefully better, telling the story better and, and um certainly within this sort of crime thriller genre, creating more suspense and, and all of that. Um, so um, so I hope that I, I have changed, <laughs> um, and, and at least in, in, in the positive sense, yeah. So um, you're an author that's obviously actively spoken out about how difficult the lockdown period was in Australia. I... I have five kids, so I can only uh, I can definitely relate to homeschooling and trying to be a writer at the same time. Um, have you seen a like Have you seen a bit of an adjustment due to the environmental shift regarding these lot sort of lockdowns um, with your writing? Like I know that there was a there was a a big sort of influx of post apocalyptic novels after. <laughs> after the pandemic and you, you touched on the van life sort of influencer as well there was a bit of an influx of people going and traveling around in vans have you found your writing has changed as a result of you going through that lockdown period I don't think so I know the book stay awake wake which came out last year which I wrote during lockdown it's probably it's got nothing to do with COVID lockdowns nothing at all yeah but I think it infused a lot of it within the storyline because the character is um Liv is, is somebody she's got she's basically she basically sort of wakes up in a cab gets out goes to her apartment discovers that actually there are people living there and she doesn't live there anymore and she doesn't know why she doesn't remember so she's really disconnected from her life and then when she's sort of kicked out and she's sitting outside trying to figure out what to do, she discovers there's a knife covered with blood in her pocket. Yeah. And um, and she doesn't really know what's going on because she's got memory yeah. issues. So um, I think that infused a lot of the frustration of lockdown um, because, you know, I mean, I personally felt so disconnected from my life and everything was so surreal and so that book really captures that. But it has nothing to do with COVID or lockdown because I just don't think people want to read about it. And, yeah. um, you know, that people have just, you know, but um, and that was a book that I wrote while I was homeschooling my kids in the car in the driveway. Yeah. I was going to ask, do you still go back yeah. to the car at some point or another if you've got writer's block or? I do because the, the thing that's happened to us post-COVID is that, you know, you know, it used to be, I mean, it's partly because my kids are older too, but it used to be that every day everyone would go to school and to work and the house would be empty from about 8.30 until about 3. And then I'd be able to sit down in an empty house and work and nobody would bother me. And um, and ever since sort of the lockdowns, I've always got somebody at home. And it's partly because one of my kids is now uni age. Yeah. My husband works a lot more from home. He, he never used to work from home at all, in fact, which has its pluses I have to say yeah but the minus is that I don't really have my own place anymore and I am um, one of these people who I really need to work somewhere without any disruption I can't stand noise 
And so it's just a struggle to find somewhere quiet where I can work without um, the family underfoot. So um, that's definitely my life post COVID and even during COVID actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so all of your pub, all of your published novels are set in America. Can you tell us a little bit about why you chose to write The Night Swim and Dark Corners in America? Yeah, so my first novel, which is called The Girl in Keller's Way, it was set in America, um, partly because it plays around with seasons. It's sort of, um, you have a body that's discovered and it was, this. so I don't plan anything when I write, I just kind of write. And so I started off that book with a body that was discovered in the spring after the snow melted. So it couldn't happen in Australia. I mean, unless it was like up in the Alpine region. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, and it was a small college town and we don't, I mean, I think in New South Wales, there are a couple of small college towns, but in Victoria, there certainly aren't really not, not the way they are in America where you have these towns that are pretty much set up and revolve around the college there. Um, so for those reasons, as I wrote that book, it was kind of like automatically it was set in, uh, North Carolina, which, um, is a place where I visited. I have family there. Um, in fact, my mother just flew there and um, to visit her sister. So we have family there and it just sort of fitted what I was trying to do. And um, after that book came out, I um, I was I then got a big publishing deal in the US um, with the major US publisher and their preference was to have the book set in the US. Yeah. Um, it just so happened that I wrote The Escape Room, which is set in, um, it's about these sort of investment bankers who get stuck in an elevator and... Um, it's a thriller and um, and um, they land up discussing, you know, well, they're kind of these ruthless sort of Wall Street types. So it kind of made sense for that to be in Wall Street. Um, yeah. Although I think I briefly did consider it doing, you know, setting it here because this was before the US deal. Yeah. Um, but in the end, it sort of made sense. It had to be in Wall Street. So, and then after that, I got the US publishing deal and they were quite keen for the books to be set in the US. Um, which I'm quite happy with because I think that I would write different books if they were set here. I mean, you know, I just, I mean, one of the nice things for me about reading is it sort of transports you to a different place. Yeah. And so as a writer, it's kind of nice to write about other places as well, because I think that if you land up writing about, at least for me, if I was to be writing about, um, you know, setting my books here, say in Melbourne where I live, they'd be very different books. They would be sort of much more um introspective perhaps and I don't know yeah. but um you know the fantasy of being able to sort of be somewhere else and then diff create a different world is it's a lot for me it's a lot easier doing it somewhere else and so um so that's why they've been the the podcasting sort of would would play a big part as well what you could do uh with the main character Rachel in this instance and how much sort of uh how much sort of scope she would be able to, especially in the night swim, whether she'd be able to go into courtrooms in Australia, it's a bit different as well, isn't it? Yeah, that's exactly, that's true. Because when I was writing the night swim, I mean, that is a book you could not have said in Australia because the limitations on reporting of an active trial are, are so different from the US where they have a lot more leeway. And so she wouldn't have really been able to report on the trial uh, the way that she did in the US. Yeah. Um, that's a really good point. Yeah. So it, that, that as well, you know, that gave me a lot more leeway in terms of what we could do with the story because she'd be in contempt of court if she did half of the yeah. stuff <laughs> in the night swim if she did that in Australia. Um, so um, so that's true. So, um, um, I was going to say, um, you know, Lee Child, who is a, a you know, a, a writer who I really admire, um, I once read an interview with him where he he lives in New York now. He's he's English, but he he's, he moved to the US and he lives in New York. And um, one of his books, I don't remember which one, is set in New York. And he said that he found that book kind of one of the harder books to write because he knew New York. And so every time he wrote something, he had to sort of think to himself, well, does this make sense? Could you really take a train from, you know, this place to this place? Because, you know, you kind of, so instead of sort of creating this alternate reality you get pulled into reality yeah. uh, in terms of what you can do with the story and stuff and look I I think as well in regards to uh, it, it sounds a little bit I 
I do have that question regarding whether you're a planner or a pantser, but it sounds like uh, you kind of get lost in the story, I imagine, as your main sort of priority. You'll you'll just follow, you're a bit of a pantser, am I assuming correct? Or Yeah, very much so, but I'm a pantser who wants to be a, a, a plotter yeah. or a planner. Um, I, um, I do just sort of tend to start writing and then sort of see where the story is taking me, but it has its pluses and it has its minuses. And um, one of the pluses is that you just take the story in directions that you could never have anticipated if you'd actually sat down and planned the whole thing in advance. Um, and especially in Stay Awake, you know, things happen to my character and, and so on, which I would never in a million years would never have thought of it if I'd actually sat down and planned the whole thing out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the disadvantages are that it's quite stressful because you're sort of writing this book and you don't really know what you're doing with it. You have no idea if it's going to work. You're spending months and months writing like a demon, you know, 10, 12 hours a day. And you have no idea if you are actually, you know, if you've just written yourself into a corner with it, you can't write yourself out of. Um, and often you land up writing a few chapters and then you realize that's not going to work. And then you have to throw them out and start again. And um so there's definitely pros and cons to both. Uh, in an ideal world, I think I'd take the best of both. Yeah. Um, and that's what I mean about learning as you go. I guess the more books you write, the more you kind of think about how, you know, the optimal way of doing it and um, and learn from your mistakes as well. So do you spend a bit of time in the US then researching some of your books so you are um, obviously uh, mapping it out, the things that are somewhat realistic as well? Yeah, I do. I mean, obviously, during the lockdowns, I wasn't able to, but um, Stay Awake, which is set in in New York, um, I was there just before the COVID lockdowns, so, um, you know, a few months before. And um, Dark Corners is set in Florida. I've spent a lot of time in Florida. I have family there. And, um, yeah, so I do, um, when I can, go over there and do some research trips and um, sometimes writing retreats as well, which I'm hoping to do um, later this year um, so that I can, yeah, just get a feel for the place and get story ideas and, and also get some uninterrupted writing time as well. So with your time as an investigative journalist, do you sort of draw on some of that as well for certain places in the world that you've probably been as a journalist? Do you think about stories based on, oh, I remember this, when I was a journalist, there was this happening at this small town. This would be a great place to to start a story or? Um, well, I mostly did the journalism that I did. I was mostly in the Middle East um, and also Asia, but mostly most of my sort of on the ground reporting was in the Middle East. And so I was covering a lot of, um, you know, I guess, diplomatic stuff and terrorism mm -hmm. and that kind of thing, conflicts. Um and so that kind of lends itself more to kind of to more um to more um espionage type thrillers, which I love. And I've actually written two of them. And I'm, you know, the the thing is getting them published because um they're both really good books, but they sort of the publishers sort of or the readers expect a certain genre. So it kind of is a bit of a um surprise when they do something yeah. a little different. Yeah. So what I would love is to be able to write both, to be able to do some espionage thriller type um, books as well as what I'm currently doing, the more psychological thrillers, which I also really enjoy. So I've got another question just through from Christy here. Um, the Night Swim had an incredible narrator that was involved with that project and a lot of our readers have spoken highly of that narrator. Um, did you have a... Um, did you have a part to play in selecting narrators for the audiobook side of things or I have in the past interestingly um I don't know it's to do with rights issues the I think that they do different audiobooks in different countries so in the US they've they've done the already they sent me actually the audio files for dark corners yeah and they it sounds amazing. They've got really great. They're using two narrators for that. Yeah. Um. And in Australia, it's done by Penguin Random House. And so in the past, I have been involved, but I'm not integrally involved. Um, I think I was involved um, certainly in the US with deciding that we wanted to have two narrators because we have the podcast chapters, and then we sort of have the the other chapters with the story. So I thought it's nicer to have two separate voices rather than one. Um. 
And um, we did the same thing with Stay Awake as well. Um, but, but yeah, the, the people that um, the, my publishers choose, they, they're amazing. I mean, these voice actors, they are just incredible. They really bring the story to life. And it's kind of weird as a writer listening to your own words. <laughs> Uh, you know, I read that first chapter not very well, but, you know, you listen to how they read. It's just beautiful. Well, uh, Christy was saying as well, have you thought of narrating your own book? So <laughs> you obviously did a decent enough job of it. <laughs> oh, well, that's nice. Uh, I haven't, but, um, um, yeah, maybe one day in the future. But at the moment they've got some very talented um, voice actors who do it, who do an amazing job. And they also, because the books are set in the U.S., they tend to have an American accent, which... Yeah, I can't do very well. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I can, uh, I can relate to that. Um, so, far as the uh, transitioning from a writer, from a journalist to a writer, did you find that like a smooth process, or was that something that you really kind of struggled with? Um, it was something that I struggled with. I mean, it's something. Um, I mean, it's kind of was a journey. So, I mean, I'd always wanted to write books, but um. And I then I have this story that I, I sometimes tell when I when I was pregnant with my first child, I was in the Middle East at the time, and and I was going to have you know three months of maternity leave, and I thought, oh, this is great, I'm going to finally sit down and write a book, you know, <laughs> three months without having to go to the office, this is going to be amazing, and you know, I was completely unprepared for what it was like having a baby. Um, yeah, you know, this poor baby who had these parents who were completely ill prepared. <laughs> Had yeah, no idea what to do one. with him. <laughs> I've got a friend that's due to have a baby in October, and he's already planning a snow trip in June. And I'm, I'm telling <laughs> him, it's just not going to happen. He's he can't hear it, so you wouldn't be the only one. Yeah, you just can't. It's, I don't think it's anything that you can really prepare for. As it happens, that pregnancy was a difficult pre pregnancy, so I decided not to read the books about what happens after you have the baby. I was just focused on having the baby books I never read the I think I read the what do you expect when you're expecting but not what to expect after you're expecting so mm -hmm. it was a bit of a shock and and of course I didn't write anything because um we just spent I spent three months being completely sleep deprived and and you know and this poor baby you know the first child to these parents who had no idea <laughs> oh it was all a shock to all of us I think so I didn't write any books and so I only um to cut a long story short I am, um, I'm sorry, the phone's ringing here and I, I can't stop it. So sorry about that. Right. Um, but anyway, to cut a long story short, I, I wrote the, um, and it's usually, by the way, these calls, you know, these scam calls, yeah. it's yeah, all you yeah. these days. <laughs> anyway, to cut a long story short, I only started writing books once I had my third child and I moved back to Australia and I wasn't working. So um I decided after he was born to take a little bit of a time out and to use that time to actually write. And um, and so that was when I started writing. And it's always been a bit of, I guess, a struggle because um, because um, working as a, um, a journalist, you work with a team and, and certainly the type of work I was doing was sort of high adrenaline, long hours, very sort of exciting kind of stuff, you know, breaking news and often breaking like the biggest stories in the world. Um, and so it's always, it, it was an adjustment to, um, you know, it's very different writing a book. It's very solitary. You don't have a whole, you know, when, as a journalist, you sort of walk into the newsroom in the morning and it's very, a lot of camaraderie and you sit down and there's a lot of to and fro with ideas. And as a writer, it's sort of very solitary. You kind of have to figure things out for yourself and, um, and uh, often Paris too. Well. There's no high five moments as well, I imagine, wandering around the house after you've just figured out something that had been, you know, you'd been blocked for a week or so on something. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, of course my family and some will encourage me, but it's not like working in a newsroom and you don't have that backwards and forwards and that atmosphere and, and all of that. And um, and I often compare it to a marathon because it really is, it's just a lot of stamina. I mean, a lot of people are really talented writers and could write books, but the could is different from the, you know, from actually doing it because you really need the stamina and the discipline to sit down and to write every single day and to have those difficult days where you, you know, you come out you at the end of the day and you say, oh, just, I just, it's terrible. I'm just going to throw it all out. It's horrible. I hate it. Um, 
And then somehow you have to kind of encourage yourself because there's nobody else to, there's nobody edited to come and say, yeah, I just read your work from today and it was actually really good. Keep going. So you have yeah. to somehow dig deep into yourself to, to, um, to encourage yourself to, to keep going. So it's, it's really quite different in many respects from, yeah. from journalism. Um, so we are getting down to the last 15 minutes of the webinar. So a reminder to people that are using a screen reader, uh, the keystroke is Alt H to type a question into the chat bar in the webinar. Um, time to get your questions in because we will be wrapping up shortly. Um, continuing on with that side of things, Megan, did you, a lot of people when they sort of first start out writing, they describe that process of sending, you know, book up, sending the book out to publisher after publisher after publisher and waiting for those little letters to come through, yay or nay, did you, did you have a lengthy process before your first book was published or was it something that came rather quickly for you? No, it was a lengthy process and it's quite a difficult process getting up a, uh, a publishing deal. Normally you get have to get an agent first and getting an agent in and of itself is an accomplishment because, um, you know, the process is you, you sort of write these letters, these pictures and send the manuscript and, um, usually you'll get a response saying that it'll take us three months to get back to you and we might never get back to you. <laughs> no. And then they'll tell you, but don't send it on to anybody else until we get back to you. So you don't really know, do I send, do I wait three months and get a no or never hear back? Or do I just send, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult process. And, and the other thing is a lot of the, um, the agents want different things. You know, one will want, you know, I want a 10 page synopsis. Another will want, you know, give me an elevator pitch and, some other stuff and so each time you're writing to somebody it's a whole project it's like days of work and and those are days that you're not writing a book yeah um, so um you know because there's only so many hours in the day um so it was a, it is a difficult process getting published and um yeah among besides writing the book it's then getting the the um you know getting the an agent getting a publisher and then once the book comes out um as well and then coming up with new ideas and and sitting down and doing it all over again it's um it is a very um it's not a straightforward process at all yeah definitely not do you find it's a similar sort of process in the states as what it is over here in australia or yeah it is um I think it is everywhere. I think in the you know all over the world it's it's and it's i mean it's partly also um you know, these days um, with digital, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot competing against books now, you know, it used to be yeah. books and maybe you'd go to the cinema and occasionally you'd watch, you know, you might watch some TV, but now you've got the streaming channels. And, and so people often choose streaming channels rather than reading books, or you can listen to podcasts, you can't do everything. Yeah. So there's a lot competing for people's attention besides um, people's attention besides books. Uh, which I think makes it even more difficult. And now we've got AI yeah. and who knows what that will do <laughs> to the yeah. industry. Yeah. yeah. Um, you could probably write a book all about that, couldn't you? Uh, can, I, can I ask? I <laughs> <laughs> so your, your writing process, are you one of these sort of people that has like a daily word count or you're one of these people that writes three pages, throws one out? There's quite a few different processes I've heard from different authors. Um, I try and set myself a target of writing like a couple of thousand words a day. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I achieve that and sometimes I don't. Um, often I'll start my writing day by looking back at the pages that I wrote the previous day. And sometimes I'll spend, you know, I might have six, seven hours before the kids get picked up or whatever. And I'll suddenly five hours into that, I'll realize I haven't written anything fresh because I've been working on the previous day's stuff and, yeah. Um, yeah, but, you know, in an ideal scenario, I'll come in and I'll write about 2,000 words a day. Yeah. And then hopefully after about two months, I'll have something that I can then work with and then rewrite into a, a proper first draft. So do you traditionally create a character first or the plot? Um, it depends on the book. Each book has been very different, to be honest. Yeah. And, um, you know, The Night Swim, I think it, if I remember correctly, it was the setting. Yeah. And it was the story that kind of started the book off um, about the sister. And, um, yeah. and, you know, in the escape room, 
which was set in an elevator, I was actually stuck in a lift with my son right. uh, for a few minutes uh, in a shopping center. And it was, it was just this strange, you know, everything went black and there was no way to communicate. And, and I, anyway, I just sort of had this idea of well, what would happen if you put these sort of work rivals, colleagues who are rivals in an elevator and they got stuck there for a long time, what would happen? What kind of tension would build between them? Um, so that was just the, an idea and I just started writing from there. So each book has been very different. And do you, do you find that you're, that you're reading a lot as well? Like who are you reading at the present moment? Um, I, um, I don't tend to read when I'm writing because I yeah. tend to, it affects my, I can't explain it, but it's sort of, I land up picking up whatever I'm writing. Like I'm, I'm afraid first of all of, kind of inadvertently <laughs> plagiarizing yeah, yeah yeah I get it um so although like for example Lee Child apparently reads a book every day so I, I totally admire him for doing that but um I don't um so usually when I have writing breaks I try and read as much as I can and I generally can't remember anything like when people ask me they always ask me when I do these podcasts and stuff um interviews or what are you reading and then I always have a mental blank um <laughs> so um it's usually kids' books of me, you know, pig the pug. <laughs> I often, well, I often land up going back to books that I really have enjoyed in the past. For example, I'm a huge fan of John le Carré. I mean, he's an amazing writer and you can, I just feel like I can learn so much from him. But um, but I'll read whatever. I'll go to the library or I'll go to my bookshop and I'll, whatever catches my eye, I'll just come home with a pile of books and I'll, I'll read, and I'll read them, uh, you know, in a shorter, you know, within a week or two and then I'll sort of, get back to writing again after that. So you, you do have to be reading all the time while you're writing. Um, I mean, even if it's not actually while you're writing, you, you can't yeah. be a writer and not read. <laughs> so yeah. growing up, obviously, um, or did you always want to be a writer or is it something that you've always had in the back of your mind? Is there any one particular writer that stood out for you where you went, I want to be that? Um. I don't know if there was a writer who really stood out. I always loved books. I was one of these kids I'd go to bed and I'd with a book and I'd sort of read until one or two in the morning and then wake up exhausted for school. Um, and, um, and I read, and I read, you know, everything I could get my hands on in those days. And, and actually one of the things that I think is really sad, there was, you know, very often today um, libraries tend to keep the recent books, but they don't keep classics. And it's, I mean, I personally would like to introduce my kids to some of the classics that I read as a child, and they're not so easy necessarily to get hold of. And I'm not talking about like classics as in as in um, Charles Dickens or whatever, um, but just some you know really good books that um, that they used to have that you just you can't get anymore. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if you looked for them, but you certainly can't get them at a library or even at a bookshop. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I just read whatever I could get my hands on. I mean, I used to read even like Tolstoy, for example, um, <laughs> Anne of Green Gables. I read whatever, um, I used to like, um, gosh, I don't remember his name, but he, um, he, um, what's his name? Starts with the W. Wilbur Smith. I used to love Wilbur Smith books. Yeah. Um, which I don't know if you did. You used to read Wilbur Smith. No, Wilbur Smith. No, it doesn't ring a bell. No, I'm, I might want to go look it up now. <laughs> yeah, they um, well, they they were always. I was always interested in history, and he often his books were often set, and there was always a bit of history in them. Um, they were sort of these adventure novels, often set in Africa. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So, um. I read just all, what the only thing I never really got into was fantasy and science fiction was I guess the only yeah and uh, even today I don't really read that um, other than The Martian which I really enjoyed yeah yeah um so we've already touched on the fact that you're you've got a couple of sort of espionage books sitting in the in the background as manuscripts do you you tend to keep your manuscripts do you or do you tend to kind of have a clean out once every 12 months or something like that no definitely clean keep them and you know when I have time maybe go back and polish them a bit and have another look at them and all of that um uh the problem you know the thing is that it's sort of especially since COVID the just writing has taken it's been so all-consuming that I um just when I'm not writing a manuscript I've well, at least this time around I've tried to take a bit of a break because it's been a pretty exhausting couple of years so um 
So this time around, I haven't, but in the past I have. And um, and one of them is historic thrillers, so it kind of is timeless. <laughs> yeah. I hope at some point to convince my um my uh, my agent to um help me get that published. Oh, well, we're getting to the last five minutes, so obviously normally I would wrap up at this point. If we do have any other last questions from our audience, please send those through rather quickly. Uh, what what can we expect from you in the next twelve months? Saying obviously after you've just said you're taking a break from some. <laughs> A little yeah. bit, but do we have uh, anything to keep an eye out for after Dark Corners, obviously? Definitely, but I'm still working on it. So um, hopefully, I'm not sure if it'll be this time next year, but um, within the next 18 months, I'll definitely have a new book out. Yeah. Um, I plan on doing more Rachel Crowell novels, but I also plan on doing more standalone books as well. Okay. Okay. So with... Uh, with the way that you sort of work with your novels, do you do you tend to write one book at a time, or have you got a couple on the on the go? No, definitely one book at a time. I kind of get immersed in it and immersed in the characters and the stories. And I don't think I could. I think it would be schizophrenic to do two at the yeah. same time. It's, I get it's completely yeah. confused. <laughs> Um, it's confusing I was, enough doing one sometimes, and you you're writing, and you're like, now what was that character's name again? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, look, I, I was surprised as well. Like we we spoke to an author recently and she was saying, yeah, I've got about three on the go at the moment. And I'm like, obviously in a different genre, I'm like, I don't know how you do that. <laughs> but uh, I, I think um, she'd be writing like, you know, the start of a book and then the ending of another at the same time. I'd be like, I, 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 I'm i lost. <laughs> yeah, well, I take my hat off to her because I couldn't do that. <laughs> so look, Megan, at this point in time, we're going to thank you so much for coming and having a chat to us. It's been really, really fantastic. We love your novels. We're really looking forward to Dark Corners. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming and having a chat to us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been great. Vision Australia. Blindness. Low vision. Opportunity. Vision Australia logo. Three navy blue ovals linked together diagonally within a bright yellow rectangle.